All right, everybody, it's time once again to talk about the labyrinth. This is part two of the, the labyrinth series. We're going to talk about subject one. We're going to talk about the Black Flame Empire and how it screwed up. We're going to talk again about Osriel and his connection to the labyrinth, maybe an Aurelius connection as well. We're going to talk about Jai Deshaux and his dumb self. And then we're going to prove that a major component of why the labyrinth is the way that it is, is hunger aura. I don't know if anyone's talked about this before, but I haven't seen it. Hunger aura is super important for reasons that you'll have to watch to find out more. All right, let's get started. We're going to start with subject one because no labyrinth video would be complete without at least discussing the potential fifth dread god. So the four dread gods that we know of the Weeping Dragon, the Wandering Titan, the Bleeding Phoenix, and the Silent King represent the four constellations of Chinese mythology, or like the four guardians. They're also the four guardians of Japan and a couple other nations in East Asian culture. Now, in China, there's a fifth, you know, guardian, like one that, you know, is kind of the original or the, the main one. Uh, it's the golden dragon. And then I believe in Japan, that fifth representation is the void, which is kind of ominous. So there's there's usually a fifth. Like there's the four normal guardians and then the fifth, which is like the more powerful one. And so keep that in mind as we go through these, these next few slides. All right. So the first showing, uh, this is in uh, book two, Soulsmith, where Lyndon... Yaren and Ethan reach the top of the Transcendent Ruins, and Lyndon finds the Soulsmith Notes. So, uh, it's foreshadowing. It happens, uh, you know, in Book 2, and we don't hear about these notes again until Book 4. But I'll read a couple parts of this, just so we can uh, focus in. So, Generation 14 shows all the qualities we'd hoped for. It demonstrates the capacity to devour and process matter with a high degree of efficiency. Though each individual contains only one binding. If a sacred artist could cultivate similar techniques, our efficiency may double. The failed specimens may be the key to success. Their auras, and I'm pointing out this is on the next page, scribbled in haste. Uh, the failed specimens may be the key to success. Their auras alter as they devour one another, growing faster than we'd ever predicted. Theoretically, there is no upper limit on this growth, but the spirit warps the flesh. Further study needed could lead to achievement of the primary goal. So uh, a couple things to point out here. Uh, this is obviously the creation of dread beasts, right? But it's we know that it's specifically dread beasts because it talks about the warping of the flesh um, and how this could uh, lead to the achievement of the primary goal. So I want to point out that the dread gods don't seem to have the kind of warped flesh. I mean, we haven't no one's gotten close enough to check them out, but the dread beasts like are rotting and they're all messed up. But that doesn't seem to be the case with the dread gods, especially with the few that we've seen described. Like the bleeding phoenix is very specifically a bleeding phoenix. It's super powerful, but it's not like rotting away, right? And then we have the weeping dragon who's very specifically described as being a blue dragon that shoots lightning and that rides on a thunderstorm. And we see the description of that twice, one in the beginning of uh, Unsold, and then the second at the end of Skysworn, when it's sleeping on the cloud. So we, we can assume from that that the dread gods have like moved beyond the weaknesses of the dread beasts that whatever that however they consume madra they can do so without corrupting themselves we know that the bleeding phoenix does this by having its blood shadows devour blood madra specifically and then they it brings it back to the bleeding phoenix um, the blood shadows are governed by hunger madra but they don't, I don't know, they, they specifically target blood madra. So, that, I mean, it's, it's an important distinction. 
that could lead to what the original purpose of the labyrinth is because later on I'm going to talk more about the labyrinth's unique aura but first we're going to talk about the unique aura of the single source uh, before we get there I want to talk uh, about the second time that the single source or subject one is mentioned and it's um, where Linden is referring to the notes and the notes reference an origin for the hunger madra a single source from which they got all their samples uh, they were trying to breed sacred beasts that left remnants of this aspect but they never made it at least not by the time these notes were written but there's a ton of artifacts a ton of artifacts, um, a Congra Madra related weaponry, the Ancestor Spear being one of them. And to make those, you need a binding. And to get a binding, you need a remnant. So where did all the bindings come from? Lyndon asks. And then Gesha says, that's what disturbs me. Because there's no evidence of it. But they had to come from somewhere. And then finally, later in book four, we get the actual name, subject one. So subject one, as we have already surmised, is the source of the Hunger Madra. Lyndon obviously wants to know all about subject one uh, because the entire purpose of their research in the labyrinth was to duplicate subject one's unique Madra. Okay, only a couple things to point out here. The entire purpose of the research in the labyrinth, not the entire purpose of the research of the labyrinth, was to duplicate subject one's unique Madra. So... I'm obviously thinking that they did the research in the labyrinth for a specific reason and they didn't create the labyrinth to do this research. The labyrinth was already there and that they just used it because of its very specific properties which would help them in their experiments and I'll get to eventually. Um, but subject one's unique matter is important. That's hunger madra because uh, here in a bit we're going to talk about Jai uh, Desho's trip into the labyrinth and he's going to encounter a unique aura which I think is hunger aura very I'm pretty sure it's hunger aura uh, but before we do that I want to walk through very briefly the black the original black flame empire's demise and how Ethan describes it uh, there's a couple little snippets in there that are interesting uh, that I want to touch on so this is where he uh, he begins to describe to Linden what dread gods are so um, they're, they're corrupted sacred beasts like the dread beasts of the desolate wilds but not quite um, Lyndon asks where they come from Ethan avoids this completely uh, he doesn't say where they, they come from but he says they're scattered all over the world uh, and he's describing how they act uh, when they wake up they're hungry obviously uh, fortunately for humanity, uh, no two have woken at the same time in centuries. Uh, but the last time they did, they destroyed the original Black Flame Empire. This is stuff we know. But it's setting the tone here for this next part. This is interesting. Uh, because the original Black Flame Empire is an ancient nation. It says so here, fallen to the Dread Gods. Uh, it was ruled by dragons, not men. And as the dragons advanced as a culture, they began to study civilizations even older than theirs. As they, uh, and as they did, they stumbled upon a... And then Ethan pauses here. He's about to say something more. They, they stumbled on a... And he stops himself, corrects, uh, and goes vague. A vast underground complex. It was abandoned even then, and it was so massive and so dangerous that not even the greatest of the dragons could map it fully. So a couple things here. This this dates the Black Flame, the original Black Flame Empire a bit. Um, it has to go back several thousand years uh, because we know that it fell before Sesheth Kunaz uh, came to power. So we assume that it fell when all the dread gods woke last. And when all the Dread Gods woke last, they wiped out the last generation of monarchs. Those two events are, are strongly correlated. They haven't been confirmed to be the same events, but they're strongly correlated. And that gives us a bit of a timeline. So we know that Sesheth Kunaz is 1,200 years old. 
So we can assume that around 1,200 years ago, the last generation of monarchs was wiped out. We don't know if Seshet Kunaz was born before that battle, where they all died, or after. We just know he wasn't a monarch yet. He became the first monarch of the, the current generation of monarchs. Uh, further dating is that we know the black dragons had their empire for a very long time before they ever found the labyrinth uh, because it took them a while to advance as a culture when we were assuming based on how we know about culture and how it advances um, and but as they advance as a culture they began to study civilizations even older than theirs so they must have studied other civilizations but then they found the labyrinth so they're doing like archaeological digs and then they find the labyrinth a vast underground complex. It was abandoned even then. So whatever the labyrinth was for was abandoned long before them. So this is 2,000 years ago, maybe. Maybe longer than 2,000 years ago. We don't know. But it was so massive and so dangerous, even though it was abandoned, that even the greatest of the dragons couldn't map it fully. Now, we know that the original Black Flame Empire did not have a monarch. It did not have a monarch dragon. That has been documented in the word of Will uh, when someone asked him to compare the original Black Flame Empire with the Nine Cloud Court. The Nine Cloud Court has always had a monarch. The original Black Flame Empire was strong, but not that strong. That's in a word of Will. And then we know that the Black Flame, like the human Black Flame Empire, had a, an Arc Lord or Sage level or sacred artist. Uh, it's not canon which one of those two is the final power level, but it was either an Arc Lord or a Sage. So if the original Black Flame Empire was much greater and more powerful than the Shadow that was the Human Empire, we can infer that the Black Dragons had someone or several someone stronger than an Arc Lord. If there's not, if they're not a Herald. And they're above Arc Lord. Sorry, if they're not a monarch and they're above Arc Lord, then they're a herald. So we assume that the strongest of the black dragons was a herald, and even a herald could not map the labyrinth fully. So something in the labyrinth or some things in the labyrinth is strong enough to be a threat to a herald. It's pretty gnarly. Okay. Now, this is the last bit of the fall of the black flame empire but it's important because originally the black flame empire found the hunger madra weapons the constructs uh, they only took gold level devices wanting to study them but they became greedy for more when they learned that the weapons had such mir miraculous effects now focus on this they became greedy for more. I don't think they became greedy for more because of the artifacts themselves. I think they became greedy for more because they were in a labyrinth that was full of hunger aura, which I'll prove in the next statement. So because they spent so much time in the labyrinth, they were constantly hungry for more and more and more of what they could get their hands on, these hunger madra artifacts. And now again, all of these artifacts have a hunger binding. They have to or they couldn't be made. So where do all these hunger bindings come from? There's thousands. I mean, well, I don't know how many there are, but there's, there's a lot of them. Okay, so now we're going to get into the only example we have of someone going into the labyrinth, and we get to see that firsthand. And I want to walk you through it. So Jai Desho opens up the door and immediately power washes out, flooding him with awe. He glanced at the aura, which seemed both shining white and utter black at the same time, as though he couldn't see through the doorway because it was both too bright and too dark. Either way, the aura blinded his spirit. This is my case for hunger aura. Hunger aura. So I'm going to speculate here for a quick second. Creatures that use and need hunger madra how do how do people get stronger? If you have an aspect of Madra, you need that aura. So if you have if you thrive off hunger Madra and you cycle hunger aura, 
your madra becomes more potent and more powerful. And we already know that hunger madra has unique properties that it keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger, regardless of your state of advancement. Because the dread gods are so powerful, but we don't know what their level of intelligence is. We just hear them described as walking dis or like living disasters and they can't be killed because they're so strong. Uh, so this is super fascinating and it has pretty strong implications for cradle Endgame. because our boy Linden has a hunger Madra arm. And if he can cycle hunger aura through his arm, I won't go any further down that rabbit hole. Uh, but now I want to talk about some aspects of Hunger Aura. So we know like Black Flame Madra makes Linden more aggressive. Uh, let's let's talk through a little bit about um, what evidence we see for the aspects of Hunger Aura. Okay, so this is straight from the text. He wanted it all. He was surprised at his own greed, but his hands trembling as he reached to open the first cabinet, the bottom row, blah, blah, blah. They contain precious treasures of the ancients. There might be millions of weapons down here. He might have enough to buy the entire empire. So basically, Jai Daisho is not typically seen as greedy. He's known as being honorable. He's known as having a lot of... He loves his family. He wants to raise his family up. But then he goes into this labyrinth and he gets over overcome with greed. And I don't have that much evidence for that here. But let's, let's keep going. So he's continuing to look for things. He sees a wooden handle, pulled it open. It was empty. So is his neighbor. And the 18 others he checked in an instant. He was sweating by this point. His gut heavy with disappointment. Where had all his wealth gone? Okay, th this is interesting because none of this stuff is his. He knows this. But now that he's in there, and he's looking for it, and it's affecting him. He's now taking possession, like he's he feels possessive over everything. He's gotten so so greedy, so green with envy, or I guess not envy, but he's so greedy that he wants everything, and he considers it his. He has a right to it. He's entitled to it. It reminds me a whole lot of Gollum when Gollum gets overtaken by the One Ring. It's his precious. So it, it, it reminds me of, um, I guess, Dragon Fever. So, um, where has all his wealth gone? And then he shakes himself. He wasn't worried about riches, but about the fate of his family. He had to tell himself that very firmly. So, I think this is a pretty interesting bit of insight into Jai Daisho. I think this might, for whatever reason, imply that his reason for practicing the sacred arts strongly involves his family. And I think that by tapping into his why, uh, like his soul fire why, it allow, gives him a bit of um, immunity to the hunger aura because he's able to resist it a little bit. So re reluctantly, he sets it back and shuts the door. He's talking about the ring, the ring he can't perceive. He left all the empty ones open. He moved to the next cabinet feeling like an idiot. Why couldn't he take the ring? Surely he should stuff his pockets. So immediately after letting go of his precious, he regrets it. Why shouldn't he take it? Surely he should stuff all of his pockets. All of this stuff is his anyway. Uh, it's the hunger aura affecting him. An underlord, mind you. Okay. So then he eventually uh, finds the Ark Stone. Now, when he swept his senses over the ring, he didn't sense anything. So he assumed it was an overlord level weapon or an Ark Lord level weapon. But then he finds the Ark Stone, which is called the Ark Stone. And he touches it with his spirit, and he can immediately sense everything. And then he's almost overcome. Um, he's almost consumed by an endless will to devour. He wanted to tear through every cabinet, cramming his pockets full. So what if he died in here? He would die the richest man in the world. The will of an underlord was not so easily swayed, and he resisted. So what gives an underlord resistance? Well, they are connected to the vital aura of the world by their why, by who they are. So he continues to fall back on who he is, which is not the richest man in the world, which is not someone that's super greedy and power hungry. 
He wants his family to rise. He doesn't care so much about himself. Everything he does is hell-bent on preserving his family and destroying the Aurelius clan. And that's the irony of Jai to show in the labyrinth, is that the labyrinth corrupts him so much. I guess his, his hatred of Ethan corrupts him enough to, you know, crack his will enough to go into this place. And then he's almost consumed by the hunger aura aspects. But let's continue. So feeling as though he were leaving behind his own limbs, he left the chamber and sealed it once again behind him. The satisfaction of success carried him away and allowed him to break the hold of whatever feelings had swallowed him back in the storehouse. So as soon as he closes the, do closes the door, seals away the hunger aura, he kind of returns back to himself and he has his, his treasure uh, but he feels like he's leaving behind a piece of himself uh, because that hunger aura connected him so strongly to wanting to just take everything and, and you know, be super greedy. So it's fascinating because he doesn't use any of the, of the constructs. So it's not hunger madra that's affecting him. It's the aura of the place. All right. So more evidence that it's aura, right? Hunger aura. Uh, right after that, Machiel's report, the Jai Patriarch exits the labyrinth proud of his prize. The facility's unique aura shone like a beacon for the duration of his visit. 26 minutes. Oh, then he talks about fate, blah, blah, blah. Um, the rest of this isn't too important to this video. It's still interesting. Uh, but let's jump to the uh, next part. So on the 26th minute, as the hunger aura fades... The bleeding phoenix regains a fraction of its consciousness. It catches the scent of power it has almost forgotten, power long lost. It calls to a memory buried deep in the creature's awareness. For the first time in centuries, its bloody feathers stir. So a couple things. If you are on a path of hunger madra and blood madra, so you're on like a hungry slaughter path, like the worst kind of slaughter path, and you are only able to satiate your hunger by having your blood spawn or your blood shadows go out and kill a bunch of people, bring in their blood aura back into you. And then you sense the hunger aura that gave you all your power, you know, it wakes you up. Uh, a memory buried deep in the creature's awareness, power long lost, power it has almost forgotten. So it's almost like the dread beasts have been almost like wasting away. I feel like that's why they go dormant for so long because they don't have the hunger aura to cycle into their hunger uh, or into their cores to make more hunger madra. And when they get access to it, all of them wake up and all of them go crazy because they're able to get stronger. So anyway, uh, then we, we see that the bleeding Phoenix hasn't been awake for centuries. So, a dread god sleeps for several hundred years. So, does that mean that another dread god stays awake for a hundred years? Or are there long periods of time where no dread gods are active? That feels super convenient. But who knows? We know that the, the weeping dragon was recently active. We know that the weeping dragon was active for at least a year. At the very least, a full year. Because we see it at the very beginning of Unsold, and then we don't see it having rested until the end of Skysworn. So we know that they are usually up for at least a year. I think they're up a lot longer, but I don't have any proof. It's just speculation. So let's carry on. Okay. Um, there's some interesting things that Ethan says that I want to call out. Uh, before I get to that, though, I want to speculate for a bit on what the labyrinth is. So I think the labyrinth is the only place on the planet where there is hunger aura. I don't know why there's hunger aura there, but something there gives off hunger aura. It is, uh, it may be it's subject one, or maybe it was a race of sacred beasts that, for whatever reason, had that type of remnant. Um, or there maybe there's some part of what makes Cradle Cradle 
vital aura also produces hunger aura or some mix of aura maybe hunger aura is the is the blinding white aura and maybe something else is the utter black aura maybe that's the void maybe there's some weird yin yang thing going on there uh, that when those two things come together in equal measure it creates hunger aura i don't know but it's it's super interesting to think about the labyrinth being the only place where there's hunger aura. So if there were some sleeping subject one hunger madra creature that is kept dormant and you're going to be experimenting on it or experimenting on its madra, you're going to do it in the labyrinth because that's probably the only place you can keep it asleep or, or whatever. Um, I also think that if you are in the labyrinth too long, you start to develop the ability to take hunger aura into your core and make it, it, it ends up twisting you and screwing you up or whatever. And that's, that's part of what allows them to get the bindings. That's part of what allowed them uh, to create the dread beasts. So uh, that's kind of the theory there. I think that the labyrinth is the source for hunger aura and that's why Osriel used hunger aura uh, or that's why I think uh, Osriel was in there he was utilizing hunger aura in the crafting of his first weapon um, I think hunger aura may have something to do with how he died and was reborn uh, perhaps he died and was reborn a hunger a a either a human or a sacred beast with the ability to uh, take in other all types of auras and madra uh, into himself and, and strengthen himself who knows I also um, I think that is what went into his creation of the scythe and why the scythe is so strong is that he was able to because of how he converted himself in the labyrinth his use of the scythe probably has some, some hunger bindings, and that's how he's able to wipe out entire iterations. He, he turns it on, he uses the scythe, and he basically eats. He eats the whole iteration. Osriel eats iterations. Hashtag it. And that's why the way cuts off, because from wherever he is, he just sucks in all the way. He sucks in everything through his weapon, and it, gets, it makes him stronger. He's like the ultimate hunger creature. I don't think he... Maybe he's subject one. I don't think he's subject one, but maybe he is. I don't know. Uh, I think that's going to be kind of a, a big deal later on. That's my speculation on Osriel. So anyway, uh, let's move on to what Ethan says, where he misspeaks. So earlier, Ethan was about to say something. That's why they're the ellipses existed and he changes what he's going to say and he goes to a more generic discussion of the labyrinth right so he faced so then later on i guess around the same time in the book actually later on in the book page 270 he faces linden and he says you mentioned that you saw several doors into the great labyrinth in your homeland linden never said he saw multiple doors in his homeland Linden said he saw one door and that he's seen two total because late like hundred and whatever pages earlier, Linden says he's only seen two. There was one, one, shoot. There was one in my homeland and then the transcendent ruins one. So he said, there's one in my homeland. And then Ethan says, is that so? He asked surprise. Well, you're lucky indeed think there's an Aurelius connection with the labyrinth. I really think there's a connection because in the same book, Lyndon says he's only seen it once in his homeland. He's very specific. There was one in my homeland. And then later on, Ethan says, you mentioned that you saw several doors in your homeland. He misspeaks. He misspeaks. He almost misspoke before. He misspeaks this time. And he knows more about the labyrinth than he lets on. He might know more about Sacred Valley. Not convinced of that. Okay. Then he talks about the monarchs in a very relaxed way. 
So the monarchs, they're the most powerful individuals in the world. Though the best they could hope for would be a stalemate. None could win a fight against a dread god alone. Not Sesheth Kunaz, not Akura Malice, not the eight-man empire, the entire nine-cloud court. We learn later in the book, saying Akura Malice's name and saying something false could get you killed instantly. So we can assume that by naming the god of dragons or the dragon king, same, same deal. But Ethan's able to name them without issue. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. That might not be misspeaking because there might be millions of people all, all over the world that name the monarchs. Uh, and maybe later on, because Ethan very specifically says he was blessed by Akura Malice. That's why Mercy's like, oh shit. And because she's right there. So there's a higher, there's, there's more variables that would draw Malice's attention. But I'm throwing this in there because it, it could be um, a little hint that Ethan... Is a little more cozy, cozy with the monarchs uh, than we've uh, been told about. But going back to the Aurelius Labyrinth connection and how it might impact Osriel, this is super speculative. This is me way out in left field. I'm off the deep end on this one. But I've already talked about in a previous video how Ethan, I think that the gate the Aurelius family uses on the other side of the planet is also labyrinth. How every 10 years or once you use it, it goes on a 10 year rotation and it opens again after 10 years. And it's kind of like a free portal across the world that the Aurelius clan uses to meet up with. I, th you know, I think that they have more of a connection with the labyrinth than we know. I think Osriel, I don't know. I'm basically done speculating at this point. But the labyrinth is super dangerous, probably because it has hunger constructs built in as defense mechanisms um, that can kill people the closer they get to subject one. I think subject one, if, if it's still in the labyrinth, is in the middle of the labyrinth, the deepest part of the labyrinth where heralds can't even go. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> we've seen on the community that certain people would be very uh, unhappy if there's not uh, a minotaur at the middle of the labyrinth. I think that would be pretty funny. I don't think that's the case, but that's still pretty funny. So um, that pretty much wraps up the video. Um, this is kind of some speculation. The labyrinth was an experimentation system for new types of madra. Um, I kind of debunked that. Uh, I think that the labyrinth is a place that naturally creates hunger aura. I do think it's a mass grave for hunger remnants. I think that's where they kept getting all the bindings, uh, was that there are hunger remnants deeper into the labyrinth that will attack you and try and eat you. And the stronger remnants are closer to the center, closer to the subject one. Uh, and that by killing these remnants the soul smiths uh, had all these uh, had all these bindings that's what i think and then by creating dread beasts they created a way to get more bindings so they wouldn't have to go deep down in there okay did osriel use it to create subject one we know that osriel was a legendary soul smith i don't know if he created subject one maybe i don't know if he is subject one i doubt it he does have a strong connection to the labyrinth he did craft his weapon in the labyrinth. And then we all, we've also heard speculation um, saying, is the labyrinth a pocket world? Uh, that would make sense. I think Little Blue in the community thinks that. It would make a lot of sense where it's like some internal pocket world. And that's why you don't, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but it makes sense. So um, I'm kind of just rambling at this point. And we're probably like 35 minutes into this video now. So I'm going to call it. This is going to wrap up the Labyrinth series, the two video series. Uh, I'll talk about the Labyrinth in other videos, but they won't be so specific and deep dive. Now, if we get later into the series and we learn more, I will probably make a follow-up video and tag it on to this once we know more. 
it's kind of like a was I right or was I wrong and then give more information so that that could be the case but anyway this video is done thanks for watching let me know what you think uh, what your theories are